<laughs> this is why I own this class, by the way. I've literally turned up in a car park, straight out of the wagon, not touched these things for a while, and she's provided a bacon sandwich. This is how we do it. Oh, she's got it. Dance floor. Got unflappable belief this is going in. Oh, come on, baby. Come on, baby. Oh, my best to survive. Kidding. Welcome back to On The Road With Iona. I am so pleased to be bringing you this episode today with someone I have a huge amount of admiration for and I'm lucky enough to call a friend. It's broadcasting legend, one of the best interviewers in the game in my opinion, and golfing fanatic, Dan Walker. I think she's got this. <laughs> right, we're stopping now. Sorry, guys. It's a great episode. <laughs> we'll see you next time. What are you doing? <laughs> Absolute treat to steal this time with you because you are one of the busiest people on planet Earth. We speak all the time because mm. we're friends, and I'm so grateful to be able to call you a friend, actually. It's funny that we meet in this context of an interview because you have been a real role model for me and inspiration and mentor in my own interviewing career. So the the tides have turned here in this scenario. Yeah, and this is weird, isn't it? Yeah, now for once you're having to, to answer the questions, which I know is tricky. Even in the slither of time we've had already today, I notice your default is to slip back into making it about me. But this is really a great opportunity and a rare treat to get inside the mind and the inner workings of Dan Walker. Because you're having a wonderful life there's and not much going on up there. <laughs> I don't believe that. I'm mostly that. thinking about golf. 90% <laughs> golf. You're having a wonderful life and I'd say you're making great use of your time so far mm. on planet Earth. Well, that's a good way of looking at it. And I think I think that's the way I look at it as well. Without trying to sound too, you know, trite or deep and meaningful about it, I just think that every person you meet is an opportunity to make their life a little bit better. Mm. And I think sometimes you can choose to make someone's life a little bit worse or someone's day a bit worse. And I, I don't see the point of that. I think anybody that you bump into, can you be positive? Can you have a positive influence on them? Can you make their day a bit brighter or help them think about something in a better way? That's how I like to live my life. I don't get it right all the time. I'm very thankful for the opportunities that I've had. I'm really thankful for the loving family that I've got. And, you know, my mum and dad who gave me uh, from a, you know, not a, wealthy background but just they gave me opportunity and they gave me that curiosity which I think has driven me through everything I've ever done but I just it's weird that we're having this conversation now and and talking about these things because my mum actually rang me last week and she listened to um, Classic FM and she rang me up and she said we, we did alright didn't we Daniel and I said what do you mean she goes well you know we brought you up in a council house in Crawley mm. and you now I've just listened to you presenting Classic FM on national radio. And I think my mum's always, she's, she's really proud of what I've been able to do um, and the opportunities that I've been able to grab. But she, she doesn't create a song and dance about it. But I think she just had a little moment there where she thought, you know, well done. And I know it's, it's lovely for your mum to, <laughs> yeah, yeah. to feel like that. Just want to be clear, we are into March now in 2024 and it must be three degrees Celsius today. And then it's got a wind chill factor taking it to minus three. So this is going to be interesting, but this is why we love it, isn't it, Dan? This there is are, what golf's all about. There are not many people I know that love golf more than you. I adore golf. Just if you look that way, right, that actually looks like quite a nice summer's day. Yeah. Don't be fooled by that because it's freezing. How many layers have you got on? One, five. two, three. Yeah, I'm fived. These aren't even golf gloves. These are the proper winter gloves I've got out today. Okay, Dan, so how's your golf? Um, Handicap looks good, but I'm, I just, I'm doing so many jobs at the minute, I haven't got time. Yeah, so. I know. Do you ever sleep? No, I sleep about four hours maximum. Right. One thing I don't lack, I own, confidence. I'm convinced I'm going to shoot like 58 today, so. I know that feeling. What could possibly go wrong? Oh, my word. That's like a rocket, Dan. What a shot. That's okay. Out of the car, straight yeah. from the radio. <laughs> All right, I see, I see you. I thought about my first swing the entire way here, though, if that helps. <laughs> okay, That's visualization. I'm going to go down the left a little bit. Try and get my Scottish golf shot out here. Ah. 
Honestly, that's the place to go. That'll Safest play. housing. That is just one of the best swings you're going to see in golf, isn't it? <laughs> that don't be silly. You are far too good to be on YouTube. You just you get get on tour. <laughs> <laughs> The lovely thing about doing this with you today, Dan, but it was golf that brought us together yeah. in 2019 at Port Rush. Yeah, we um, we met at one of the great golf courses, didn't we? Yeah. And um, I'm not just saying this because you're here. You know, sometimes you just get on with somebody immediately. Yeah. I remember walking down the first fairway with you. I thought, well, oh, she's great, and Aww. we'll just. I reckon we could be pals. Yeah, and here we are, <laughs> 2024. We've made it this far and continue to love golf. And actually, I don't know if we. Have we played since then? No, we talked about it a lot. Right. <laughs> yeah, and I've watched you play, obviously watched you at the BMW PGA Pro-Am, yeah. which was amazing. I know how much you love that day. <laughs> I do love that confidence you have. And just because you're confident, I suppose, you bring this wonderful kind of relaxedness with it because you just love it. I love it. I don't mind the buzz. I like the red light on the camera. Yeah. I like all that. That's great. Oh, she's got it. Come on. Dance floor. That'll do. Dan, what have you got? Well, I've got a mouthful of bacon sausage. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to try a little two iron. Okay, love it. Let's see how she goes. Oh, my word. Goodbye, my friend. <laughs> nice strike. I think I might have got stuck behind that one a little bit. It's okay, we'll find it. Where do you remember first starting your golfing journey? I was a very sort of hyperactive kid and my mum was always looking for things to keep me entertained. So actually there's a municipal golf course in my hometown Crawley called Tilgate Forest Golf Club. In the school holidays, my mum used to send me down there to hunt for balls. Right. And I would spend the entire day, arrive there first thing in the morning, just walk around the bushes, in the trees, picking up balls and then <laughs> selling them back to people who were no way. On the first tee, yeah. That's hilarious. I actually had a similar chapter in my life when I was an early golfer and I didn't have much money. And I used to go out in the night around Beaconsfield with a ultraviolet torch. When you shine an ultraviolet torch in the rough, golf balls shine back at you because it picks up the white. Always thinking. And I used to package them up into the branded bags, sell them for a five or a bag. What was your first club? I got half set all at once. Half set of second hand tailor -made. My granddad got me a seven iron for like this Nick Faldo thing. No way. Yeah. It was uh, just a birthday present because he knew I was obsessed with any sport. Right. So he said, what about golf? And here's a, here's a seven iron. Why just... do you think your mum decided to <clears throat> drop you at the golf club? Did she just think big open green space, he's probably quite safe there. Yeah, he'll, drop run, him off. he'll run around, he can keep himself entertained. And I've always been chatty. I like talking to people and I can make friends relatively easily so I just made some good pals down there got to know the guys who um, drove the buggies around on the you know picking up the balls yeah and then yeah I used to spend quite a few hours just watching other people play golf oh that's lovely spinny little one beautiful great touch that's okay uphill putt nice all the pros say that uphill putt <laughs> when they hit a bad shot just say uphill putt <laughs> that's so true <laughs> Right, bit of uphill left to right here. Tell you what, this would be some birdie to kick us off on a long <laughs> par four into the wind. It would actually. Come Beautiful on. greens. Look at the roll on that. Get in! It's <laughs> 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 my trusty old friend. I don't honestly don't know what it is. This putter is a joke, Dan. You've got to try it. <laughs> That's incredible. It's like a decent drive. What did you have, about 200 into the wind? Yeah. Three words, smacked it. My other problem with golf is that I, if I concentrated, I could be up, but I just tend to talk the whole way. And I can't really <laughs> stop chatting even when I should really be concentrating on what I'm doing and trying to put the Go ball on. in the hole. Give you that one, that's good. Because that, she's already got a birdie in the bag. I told you, she's a machine. First time I interviewed Glenn Hoddle, who was my dad's, you know, my dad loved watching Glenn Hoddle play football as a, as a kid, he's a big Spurs fan. So first time I interviewed and then worked with Glenn Hoddle, I remember my dad rang me up when I first went on Question of Sport. That was a big moment for him because we used to watch that program together. Yeah, yeah. I remember, I think I presented like 14 or 15 FA Cup finals. And again, the first one that I presented, I, my dad rang me on the way home from that because that was something that was part of my childhood, watching sport with my dad. Mm. Um, and 
Uh, so it's nice that they've had some special moments along the way because I, I suppose I tend to compartmentalize it a bit and I'm always thinking what's next and I don't tend to revel in something. I'm like, okay, that was great. I did a good job. Move on to the next thing. Mm -hmm. Even on something like, you know, something quite momentous like being on air for the death of the Queen. You know, I was one of those presenters who announced that the Queen had died and you've got to think about every word because everything you say matters mm. and the tone and your face and your demeanour and what you're wearing and how you convey those really meaningful words to somebody when you, you're thinking about the fact that basically everybody who's watching has not known life without this woman in it mm -hmm. and all of a sudden everything seems to change and you can feel very uncertain and unsure in that situation but I remember doing that program, finishing it, and then as I walked out of the studio, I was thinking, okay, we, we've done that. You know, uh, obviously the funeral is to come, but um, you've just got to then move on to, to the next thing and try and do the next job, whatever that might be, as well as you can. Mm. That's how I try and look at it, I think. One of the things that impresses me most, and you've just hammered it home again once again, is how wide reaching your career is you touch so many different subjects and topics mm. you know i work in golf and that's all consuming it takes so much effort and energy for me to feel like i'm at the top of the game mm. to be able to stand and deliver but you somehow manage to jump from one end of the spectrum to the other you know from the from the death of the queen to the premier league and then to yeah. classic fm i know but i don't i just see it as life like so, it's just all it's various colors of life because, right right like golf is brilliant and i love it mm. um but it's just it's it's something else that you know we do yeah but yeah there's there's all sorts of things that come into our lives and i, I always think that we work in an industry where people have always said to me, well, you know, you, you work in regional television, can you work in, in national TV? You're on the radio, can you be on uh, TV? Can you do a news programme? Hold on a minute, can the guy who does sport do this? Can you write a book? And the, people are always questioning you. And for me, it's, I always see it as there are different people that I speak to. I love telling stories. I love talking about people. I love writing about them. I love reading about them. I love speaking about them. I love presenting programmes about them. But it doesn't matter whether they are the best golfer in the world or whether they've been through something absolutely horrendous in their family, you've still got to deal with them in the, in the same way. The questions in some way are the same. Mm -hmm. It's just about trying to get to know somebody, mm -hmm. trying to get to the bottom of what makes them tick and then give them space to tell that story without getting in the way. Mm -hmm. So it doesn't really matter whatever the subject matter is, all we're doing is we're sat here and we're talking to each other about an aspect of life. Right. Today it was golf, but tomorrow it could be something completely different. Yeah, that's such a lovely way of thinking about it. Since you're so good, what are you, what are you thinking here? What are you doing? I'm just going to go down the left again. Yeah. And because I just feel right now, generally I've had a little fade with the driver. So I'm just going to thump one down the left to those mounds. Okay. There's that little fade. That's so good. Okay. What a golf course this is. Oh yes. It's a baby draw. I just thought, just the last minute I thought I'd put some draw on it. <laughs> <laughs> that was epic, Dan. <laughs> Obviously a lot of our British UK viewers will associate you with football. Yeah. We've got a brilliant international audience as well on the road to Fiona and they might not know that you've been an integral part of BBC Sport, British sport coverage mm. across the board, but you have done a lot with football. Where would you rank football and golf? Which which is your big love? Uh, it's hard to tear them apart from each other, really, because I could happily just sit and watch nine football matches back to back or an entire day of golf, yeah, like every yeah. single shot, and just soak it all up. Yeah. I love being at an event. I love talking to footballers. I love spending time with golfers. I like talking about golf. I can't walk past a mirror without checking a golf swing. <laughs> Quick. <laughs> Quick little hand position Quick check. Hand, yeah. Sport generally is just the best thing. And, you know, as a kid growing up who dreamt of holding a putt to win the Masters yeah. or, you know, scoring a goal in the FA Cup final, going to a World Cup or doing anything at the Olympics, to then get into a world where you're not playing it, but you're up close and personal with the people who are just the best in the world at it. Uh -huh. I still genuinely have to 
pinch myself quite regularly yet. Have you ever considered moving more into golf broadcast? Uh, I did for a bit. The way I look at it is, I think I've explained this to you before. Uh -huh. I just see myself as sort of standing in a room and there's quite a few doors in that room. Yeah. And sometimes you push them, and sometimes they shut in your face, sometimes they open without you thinking about it, sometimes they're right in front of you, sometimes they're over there, sometimes they're behind you. And my job is to go through those doors and see what's on the other side of it. Right. And sometimes it's the wrong door to go through, but you learn something along the way anyway. What do you do? Do you turn around and go back or find yeah, another door? Yeah, pop back to the main big room. Yeah, and back find to the main door. entrance. <laughs> <laughs> All right, I'm going to give this another three bit. I'm, I can tell it's a long, long way, so I've got, I'm going to give it everything I've got to tell you the truth. Dance floor, I own a Stephen. Okay. Oh, come on. Come Whoa. back. Come back. Here she comes. <laughs> Couldn't ask for much more, really. Jesus. That was an almighty drive, Dan. I know that you love watching the golf because I often think to myself when I'm broadcasting around the world with Sky on a Thursday, one o'clock, I'm thinking, nobody's watching this. Who's, who's watching golf I, on a I, Thursday? I, I'm watching it. And then I see a text <laughs> coming from Dan going, nice interview, Iona. I think, who is watching? Dan's watching on a Thursday, a random interview. <coughs> so I know you love it. I know you love watching the golf. And I always think of you when I'm out there because I think there's probably a good chance Dan's watching this. Are we into the wind here? It's, from this angle you are, because it's coming off the right. I'll give you a number, 120 on the dot. What do you reckon that's playing, about 135? Yep. I always think golf like surfing, you've got to time it. Yeah. Some people can really get in tune with the wind, others struggle. I think you've got to feel it in your bones and go, now's my moment. Beautiful strike. On a bit far left. It's dancing. Who's your favourite golfer to watch on telly? Well, that's a great question. I'm, I'm one of those people, I'm a full supporter of Rory McIlroy because I want him to do well. I always mm -hmm. want him to do well. I love his attitude. I love Matt Fitzpatrick. Oh, he, he's definitely one of my favourites. Also the combo of him and Billy Foster. Yeah. It's one of the all-time great combinations. I love the fact that Matt eats his way around the golf course as well. Like. He, um, when, he, when he first started out, I think did he, it was his first win at Woburn. I can't remember what the first win was. And I remember watching him walk down the uh, either the 15th or 16th, I think it was. Yep. And he just pulled out a tinfoil wrapped sandwich out of his bag. <laughs> I thought, that is what I'm talking about. Just munching away. Also, there's no one that's more detailed than yeah. Matt Fitzpatrick. Yeah, he loves his stats. I've always liked Ricky Fowler. Yeah, me too. Love watching Fred Couples play golf. The year Tom Watson nearly one at Turnbury, oh, 2009. Yeah. So on the Tuesday of that Open, I was out on the course doing interviews with everybody yeah. and managed to get hold of him. And I said, uh, Mr. Watson, is it okay if I grab two questions for the BBC? He went, yes, of course it is. So I asked him a first question, asked him a second question, and then I started a third and he went, young man, he says, you said two questions, I've got a major to win. And shook hands and walked off, I thought, Absolute class. Yeah. And he nearly did it. Yeah. Me. Good lesson to learn for any broadcaster. Stick to your word. I think you taught me that. <laughs> I, I learned that off Tom Watson, so I'm just passing it on. It's a little green, isn't it? It's a tiny little blighter. Beautiful little green, though. Sit. Okay. You've left yourself a bit of a perilous part there. I have, but it's just my length. <laughs> well, that. I have witnessed that laid first it up hand. just to there. Got unflappable belief this is going in. Can't get enough of it. Oh, come on, baby! Come, come on. on, baby! <laughs> You're kidding! That is a disgrace. Not if that had gone in, I'd have just walked in. You know what I mean though? The power of positive thinking. <laughs> I, it was never ever anything but net in my mind. What is going on there? You forgot that it was into the wind. That's just like, that's one of them. Oh, shambles. Love golf. Just going out the hole for this one. I like that. Come on, keep rolling. 
Keep rolling. She's got it. She's got another one. <laughs> right, I gave you a high five the first one. That's getting a hug. <laughs> I'm telling you, there is something in this butter, and sometimes she goes really cold on me, but when she comes back, boy, does she come back. She did say she was going to hold it. <laughs> Wowzers. There you are. It's a par all day. Tough school, this. You've managed to kind of shape a career hmm. which has taken you so, so many fascinating parts of life, but sport has been kind of at the core of, of a lot of what you've done, and you've met some people who've achieved greatness. Mm. And of course, you and yourself have achieved greatness in the broadcasting world, and you've still got, you know, you're only in your 40s, you've, yeah. got, the rest of, you've got the rest of your life. What common characteristic do you observe in people who are great? Oh, that is a great question. Um, and as somebody who, I think I said out on the golf course, I love spending time with brilliant people mm. because I just, I consider myself to be a, a good sponge. I just love soaking up ideas, ways mm. of doing things uh, from people of all different walks of life. And I think, well, it depends how you define greatness. Do you well, define, it's up to you. Yeah, because if you define greatness in sort of success, then I think it's that, it's that drive. Um, but I'm not sure I would define greatness like that. I, I define, I think greatness for me is about the impact you have on other people. And I think that is, there is a, a kindness and a compassion that I think is really marks people out. And that it's that opportunity where you can benefit yourself, but can you benefit yourself and benefit other people at the same time? Mm -hmm. And I think maybe really successful people have that total you know, zone of, this is about me and only about me and about me getting to the top of that tree and I don't care who I leave behind. Yeah, yeah. Well, I, the people that I really admire and the people I would consider to be great are the ones who are always looking behind them or to their sides and thinking, well, can I bring her up with me? Or can I open the door for that person at the same time that I go through? Mm -hmm. um, I know that probably sounds like a... No, I believe I, it's it not, it's not you've a, done it with I, me, yeah. so I know it's well, true. But I just, I love... I think because I had to work really hard to get to the opportunities that I had, and no one, I don't have anyone in my family who worked in the industry. My mum and dad were both teachers and my dad worked as a, as a minister in the church for a bit as well. And um, you know, there was nobody to say, Dan, do this or have you tried that? And I got told so many times, you're not gonna get anywhere. You know, so many doors were closed in my face. And there could have been many opportunities for me to say, OK, I'll go and do something else. Because I always wanted to be a teacher. I was going to do a PGC and become a teacher. And I think having seen myself go through all those situations where, I mean, I'm, I'm not kidding, maybe, maybe 35, 40 people have said, you will not get anywhere in this industry. Wow. And when you hear that time and time and time again, and I'm thinking, but I feel that, I really feel that I could be good at this because I'm curious and I like asking questions and I, I feel like I'd learn to be good in front of camera or on a microphone and when I see other people and I see a little flash of brilliance like I saw with you I thought you could have an amazing career doing this doing something that you love but being really good at it and enjoying it at the same time and that's why I I love watching you be brilliant like when you I got real pleasure watching you be fantastic at the Ryder Cup now, I think I texted you while you were, when you were in the crowd on that day one, and yeah. the, they're all around you, and you just looked in your element. And then when you're doing the presentation at the end, uh, I get as much pleasure from seeing you be amazing doing that as I would do from doing that job myself. Mm -hmm. um, and I love, you know, seeing new journalism students come through from backgrounds that are often closed off to journalism. Yeah. I have a bursary scheme that supports people who can't afford to do a postgraduate course because I couldn't afford to do a postgraduate course. Yeah. But you know, I borrowed that money that enabled me then to get into the job that I now do. But I always think there's so many barriers. Otherwise, every journalist looks the same and, and sounds the same because they're all from the same background. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I think there's got to be a, a far more breadth to that yeah. because I want you and me to be able to ask questions but also 
you know, somebody from a completely different background and yeah. somebody from a different part of the world and somebody from a different cultural heritage because we can all ask different questions and all tell a slightly different story from yeah. the same person. Mm. And I think that's really essential. Mm. A bit like golf as yeah. well, you know, it's it's continuing to open doors in golf and it's great to be a part of golf right now, actually, in, in a time when it is changing so quickly. Yeah. Oh, if only I had to hold that chip as well. I know, a, mate. I really Content. Thought, thought, absolute yeah. content. <laughs> <laughs> I thought you had it. <laughs> It's another gorgeous hole, isn't yeah, it? Yeah. I love an elevated tee. Oh. But what I was going to say, this is a tough question. Who's been the best company you've ever had on the golf course? Uh, what do you look for in a good golfing company? Someone I can take the mickey out of and will take the mickey out of me. Right. You can flick from having a serious conversation to just ripping the bits out of them. I played a lot of golf with Alan Shearer. He, he would be, I think we're actually, we're undefeated on... What? Uh, as a as a pair. Right, I need to find myself a partner, anyone out there, and take you guys on. Yeah. Oh no, actually that's not that is we've lost once. Okay. In Russia. Oh. During the World Cup in 2018. All right. And we played the club pro, and this guy was a Kazakhstani billionaire, Whoa. and he played off 18 and shot five over, and we got absolutely murdered. And thankfully, he'd offered quite a high amount of money for the game. And Alan Shearer said, no, we're playing £10 the front nine, £10 the back nine and £10 the match. <laughs> <laughs> Saved us a lot of money that day. Excellent. That was a Geordie accent in case you're wondering. Not bad. Right. Better than I've got. What are we doing? Well, what's, this what's... is going an absolute mile. This is drivable for you because elevated, downhill, downwind, 401 yards. You'll be flirting with the front. I'm going to go down the left and stay away from those bunkers. Okay, left and a drift? Yeah, drift, because they've got that wind, yeah. Okay. I think those bunkers are actually carryable. Yes! That's what I like to call my five layer swing. <laughs> just kind of... That's perfect, that though, isn't it? Yeah, it's fine. It's just, you know, you have to play more within yourself when you're wearing five layers. Yeah, I'm... Quite so dynamic. I might give you the full noises on this one. <laughs> Here we go. Woo! <laughs> that looked very good, Dan. Love that. As long as you just shout. It's got a chance of being close. Right. Just scream really loudly. Not sure about the finishing position, but... <laughs> a for effort. Yeah. <laughs> Very cold fingers. Don't mind telling you that. <laughs> yeah, it's bloody freezing. <laughs> I'm warming up though as we go. Yeah. Let's talk numbers. 144. Off the down slope. It's going to come out a bit lower. <clears throat> down the breeze. It's going to get knocked down out the air. It's playing about 130, I think. 132. Little nine iron. Come Sit. on. Sit. Oh, come on. Dance left. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Uphill putt, <laughs> uphill putt. Don't, don't leave me hanging, come on. 95 over the trap. Okay. And then about 115 to the Bag. flaggage. Tough shot here because it's straight down the breeze. Yeah. See so that, the two stakes, mm -hmm. going to go between that stake and the, just to the right of that second stake. Like that, a lot. Good. It's gone 100, tiny bit right that. Could be okay. I'm 90% sure this is going in. Okay. <laughs> Hit it. Oh, Daniel, Ooh. didn't quite get the check. I love that it was never going to be short. You gave it a real go. Sorry. In all honesty, that's good for me, if you want. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I'll take it. Bit of right to left, up and down. It's actually breaking hard at the end. I would love you to hold three of these on the trot. <laughs> this would be special, wouldn't it? If this goes in on top of those other two, this is going to make the highlights real. <laughs> right, come on then. Three okay. from three. Let's see what I can do. I think she's got this. Okay, please go. Please go. She's got it. She's got it. <laughs> 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 right, we're stopping oh. guys, sorry guys. It's a great episode. <laughs> we'll see you next time. What are you doing? <laughs> Anyone who's not watched golf before, this does not normally happen, right? This is just extraordinary. It 
it was Eric Van Royen that was doing this the other day on the PGA Tour. Some days you just have it, the holes a bucket, and Dan, there's no one that makes me feel better in your, in your I, I just love watching it. It's, it's, <laughs> I feel then. like I'm, I'm fully in the passenger seat here, but I'm enjoying myself. <laughs> what, a, what a delight. <laughs> I just don't know what to say. You see, that's, that's why you should play golf. Look at that face. Look at, look at that face. That's so good. <laughs> Oh. Right, I've not really paid attention to this in all honesty. Go on, give me that. <laughs> I mean, I just, you're on a different planet. Excellent. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I've got the giggles now. This is that moment, isn't it, when you feel like you can't, you can't miss it. And what? that's, that's the beauty. <laughs> I think that is your go-to state though, Dad. I think I'm more of a, Pessimist, really. I firmly believe they're going in, but mine don't go in. For it. <laughs> You've just delivered the goods there. No, it's ridiculous. Golf, it's a very funny game. I've obviously only known you for five years or so, hmm. but something that I think really drew me to you and, and strikes home time and time again with you is you're just kind. And I wonder where that comes from. Well, that's a great question. I think I've seen kindness and I've seen the impact of kindness mm -hmm. in other people's lives. Mm -hmm. And my mum particularly, and also my dad, they're both very kind people. And I've, I've often seen them do things sacrificially for others. And uh, I just think when you, when you see the impact that a tiny bit of kindness has, I, it doesn't matter, I know that these are on telly, but once I organized a, a guy who spent 20 Christmases on his own, I organised for him to have a Christmas tree. Mm. And it was a really easy thing for me to do because I, you know, we organised a choir outside his house, but I still know that bloke. And you know, we still have conversations and that, the kindness of all those people who got involved in that still has a massive impact on him. And I think it probably goes back to one of the things I said earlier as well. It's about choosing to make someone's life better or, or make it worse. And I think maybe stitched into everything is my faith because I can't separate who I am from the faith that instructs me. I'm, I'm a Christian, I take that quite seriously. And I think that probably impacts on everything that I do because I, I know that that's a big part of who I am mm -hmm. and that's what makes me tick. And it guides the words that come out of my mouth, my hopes, dreams, ambitions, all those things. And I also think that's probably what gives me a, an even keel in life because I don't allow praise to take me too high and I don't allow criticism to drag me too low because mm -hmm. you know, as, a, as a Christian, I know that I'm valued by God and that's what really matters. Mm -hmm. So I don't get too high, I don't get too low. And I've got a, I think I've got a good balance in life. Sometimes I don't get it right, but I feel that that, that sort of peace I feel at ease, if that makes sense at mm. all. I'm probably not explaining it very well. No, I think it makes a lot of sense, and I think it's so important to have that in your life, particularly as someone in the public eye, mm. to not put weight on your value based on other people's opinions, yeah. and to have some internal anchor that allows you to come back to that mm. when there's the world is so full of opinion. And of course, when you're putting yourself out there time and time again, yeah. You're going to get the good, the bad, and the ugly. You, you see it as well every day. You know, people will shout at you. They'll say horrible things about you. They'll act as if they know you really well, and they'll misconstrue your the way you're trying to do something. Mm -hmm. And you know, they'll tell you that you're this and you're that. And I get that every single day. Mm -hmm. um, you know, when I used to interview a politician, you'd get 500 people shouting something at you, and others shouting something else at you. And it's the same any interview I've ever done or anything I've ever done on telly. People get cross about it. Some people will love it. I'm only driven by two things. Professionally, two things drive me on. I want the programs that I work on to be the best that they can be, and I want the people who work on that program to have the best time making them. And as a presenter of that program, you can set a bit of the rhythm to that, mm -hmm. and you can um, set the bar by treating people in the right way, by being kind, by making time for other people, by um, making sure that you're working that extra hour, that you're going that extra mile, because mm -hmm. if they see it in you, then they're Mm -hmm. More willing to do it themselves, I think, mm. and it's all about always about sort of striving to make it better, but making it fun. Can you think of a time in your life when someone was really kind to you? Oh, that is a great question. Uh, 
I think the guy who first gave me a job in uh, radio was very kind to me um, because he was really honest with me. And mm -hmm. you know, kindness isn't necessarily sometimes giving you something that you want, but mm -hmm. it's telling you the truth. And I think uh, he was called John Pickford and um, still around and still a brilliant guy in radio. And I think he was just honest with me about how hard this industry is, how many horrible things people will say about you and how many people will speak to you in a nice way to your face, but then mm -hmm. you know, try and ruin things behind the scenes. And I think that was a real kindness because he saw in me when I first started out a sort of rawness and an innocence, which um, he needed to tell me what the industry was like. And I think that those kind comments in those early days actually gave me the a bit of steel that I didn't maybe have early on to deal with some of the stuff that sometimes comes your way. But also I'm a great, I love watching kindness in other people and I often get asked about you know um, people that inspire you and, and people that you look up to and I always go back to uh, I know this is an old reference but I love the story of Eric Little and Jarrett of Fire mm. and you know um, didn't run in the 100 meters uh, won the gold in the Paris games in 1924 in the 400 but then on went on to be a, a missionary in, in China and eventually died in a prisoner of war camp and um, when you look at how he acted with other people in that camp by you know, taking food and not eating a full meal and giving it to other people, and then there's this amazing story about how he was offered a chance to come back to the UK uh, when they found out he was an Olympic gold medalist and said, well, let's do a prisoner exchange. You're a famous gold medalist. Let's swap you with one of our prisoners. And he turned that down and he gave the opportunity to someone else. Wow. And he died three months later in the camp. So. I love things like that and that inspires me mm -hmm. because I think it's not about what you do on the track. It's not about what greatness you can achieve on the golf course in a TV studio. It's about who you are and the impact you have on other people. Mm -hmm. And for me, it's, there's a great Chinese proverb that says, mark the man or mark the woman who acts with honour when no one is watching. And that's the real time that you are judged as who you are and what makes you tick. And I love the fact that when it really mattered, Eric Little thought about other people mm. rather than himself. There are always going to be moments where you, you're putting yourself out there and it doesn't always go to plan. Mm. And that happens in life as well. Yeah. What would you say, Dan, has been your greatest failure? Oh, you're asking some cracking questions. Aren't you? <laughs> um, I'm not sure if I'd class it as a mistake, but I often think about, uh, I don't know if you've ever lost somebody to suicide in your life, but... I, I, I haven't. Right. I, um, I often go back to what happened to Gary Speed. I think about that a lot because I, I was on a program with Gary uh, and then the, I presented Football Focus, Gary was on it, and then the next day I heard that he'd taken his own life mm. and I'd spent most of the day with him. And I've gone over that day I don't know, thousands of times in my head. Um, you know, could I have said something? Could I have seen something? Could I have helped him? Would he still be here if I'd asked him that question or if I'd, you know, taken the time? And I'd, I, th I think there's certain things in your life which have a big impact on who you are and how you act. Mm. And that is a massive one for me because I think it's made me a better interviewer because I always think about how I finish an interview because you never know when you're going to see that person again. Mm. It's not a mistake because you know, I didn't know anything at the time and I was just having what I thought was a nice day with a friend. Mm -hmm. But I often go back to that and think, as I think lots of his friends do, could there have been an intervention sometime in that day that could have mean that he might still be here for his family and his loved ones now. So, mm -hmm. yeah, I think about that quite a bit. What impact has that had on, if any, on the way that you think about the, people's mental health, and I think mm. specifically men's mental health, in this day and age that we're living in? Yeah. Uh, well, on the 10-year on the anniversary of his death, um, I was asked to make a film about, you know, the importance of talking, because um, I've written a couple of books over the years, and his two sons, uh, Eddie and Tommy, they've only ever spoken to me about the death of their dad and I, I, I asked them and they said yes and one of the greatest 
compliments that I've ever been paid was I wrote this chapter about their dad and about uh, you know what he was going through and what he left behind and um, Eddie, one of his sons, uh, sent me an email afterwards and said, thank you for writing that about my dad. Um, thank you for what you've said. Thank you for telling the truth. Thank you for telling our story. And I'd like to think, he said, that in a few years' time, when I've hopefully settled down with a family and my wife and my kids are, are struggling to understand who I am, I can give them that chapter and say, this is why I am the way I am. And I thought, okay, that's, wow. that's, why, you write, that's why you wrote the book. Mm -hmm. You know, that's why these things happen. On that 10 year anniversary, I checked with the family and they were really happy for me to do it because I didn't really feel, it's, it's not my story to tell, you know, it's Gary, Gary's family's story to tell, but they wanted me to do it. So I did it, I found it really hard to do, but the impact of that video, which has been watched millions of times, is still sort of baffles me. And I often wonder, you know, why do things like that happen? Why do, why, why do you make a video like that? And I, that came out while I was in the middle of Strictly Come Dancing. And um, I stupidly watched it on the Saturday that we were dancing a, a dance. And it's quite a hard video to watch mm. because I didn't really hold it together because I still find it difficult to talk about on occasions. Mm. And um, I watched it go out and the, my phone was going crazy because people were reacting really positively to it, which was lovely. And then I remember waking up the next day and there was an email on my phone and I read it. It was from this guy who said, I'm at rock bottom. My wife has left me. My kids don't want to know me. I've lost my job. I think daily about ending it all, but I'm not going to because I watched that video. Wow. And I was like, okay, that's, there's the reason. Yeah. Because that guy's still here because of that. Yeah. Um, and I'd like to think that even though his death has really made a massive impact on a lot of people, mm -hmm. and it was front page, back page news, I think we're in a much better place now, you know, over a decade on. And I'd like to think that if his two sons were in that situation, they'd talk to somebody. Mm -hmm. And I'd like to think that men of that generation now would not just settle for, are you okay, and let's crack on, but they might go a little bit deeper and they might sort of see that their friend is struggling mm -hmm. or notice something about, you know, their brother or their dad or their uncle, whoever it might be who isn't quite right mm -hmm. and not just gloss over it and try and dig a little bit deeper. I think we're better at that. Mm -hmm. And I'd like to think that that's a, that's a really big step forward. Mm. We talk quite a lot about mental health mm. on this channel because golf, I believe, can, can and does impact people's mental health really positively. And I think in the topic of men's mental health specifically, yeah. who without wanting to generalize too much, can bottle things up and totally, not, yeah. not talk about the feelings quite so readily. Golf can be an amazing gift for mm. doing just that and getting the company um, to sometimes just have a little chat that you really need that can change the whole course of your day, your week and ultimately your life. Mm. My faith is really important to me. I think that gives me that level and that, um, I think for me, an understanding of the world that I'm in and the life that I'm living. But inside of that, I, I love the peace of a golf course. Mm. Um, and I, I know we weren't out there for hours today but that's a really lovely memory that we've got yeah, yeah and that's woven into that wonderful sport of golf mm -hmm. and you know, I don't know about you but th those three putts you hold back to back that's a that's an amazing thing to watch yeah. and I, I think that's a that's a lovely experience and it's just the fun that goes along with that and the silly conversations and the laughter and the occasional serious conversation that you might have and I I think my head is always completely free when I'm on a golf course. Mm -hmm. I just, I like the wind in the hair and hopefully not quite as cold as it's been today, but I just love that feeling of being outdoors yeah. and, you know, feeling the grass in your hands and watching the ball roll in sometimes and spending that time with either people that you know well or people that you're getting to know well. Mm -hmm. And I, I don't think there's many sports like that. Mm -hmm. And I just, I love the fact that you can talk and have a conversation when you're playing golf. You yeah. can't really win many sports. Totally, yeah. But you've got time. You've yeah. got time to think about stuff and have a laugh and take the mickey out of your friends. And yeah, yeah. It's a, it's a beautiful sport to get involved in and I love watching people fall in love with it. I've got a big charity project with um, Jessica Ennis Hill and John Richardson called Bright Young Dreams, which is trying to help the next generation of kids coming through with their mental health. Really? Yeah. Amazing. Um, 
I mean, if, if, it, if it gets off the ground, it yeah. is off the ground already, but if it actually gets traction and gets picked up, it will hopefully be a game changer. Wow. Because we've got a generation of kids and the next generation coming through as well, as well who are under so much pressure yeah. and who are <sighs> facing things that you and I never faced when we were that age. And they are being told things about the world that they live in, which are really quite scary and difficult. And they're also told that, please solve all these problems that we've created. Yeah, totally. And um, I don't think they're, at the minute, they're given the tools to, to deal with that. And I'm not sure their parents know how to deal with it. And I'm not sure there's enough provision in the healthcare system to help them. And unhealthy children become unhealthy adults who have unhealthy families. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So it's essential that we get it right. Mm. And it's essential that we build resilient kids who can deal with stuff and don't crumble under pressure of exams or stress, yeah. whatever it might be, yeah, because yeah. life is full of that. Totally. You know, there are situations, I tell my ch own children this all the time, there are situations you will face where it's hard mm -hmm. and you've got to dig deep and you've got to find something and you've got to get a way through it. And it's okay to feel that rumble in your stomach of anxiety and a little bit of pressure because that's what life is like mm -hmm. and you've got to find a way of dealing with that and come through the other side and I really hope that we can help our children and the next generation of children coming through to be more resilient mm -hmm. and to have that understanding that they've got a power inside them that can help them to deal with the world that they'll face. Mm. Yeah. What a wonderful thing to do. Yeah. Where can parents who are listening to this find out more about that? Uh, if you just look on the website, Bright Young Dreams, you can see what our plans are. We're trying to raise five million quid uh, in the next 12 months. We've got big plans for concerts and events, and we're trying to build an infrastructure that children, carers, teachers, parents can all access. And also try and change the way that children get treatment, because anyone who's been through this, any parent out there who's you know, got a child who is struggling with it will know how hard it is just to get an assessment in the first place, mm -hmm. and then to get some sort of idea of how you can help that child. And all the time, you know, that childhood is disappearing while that child is, is struggling. So there's a whole you know, world of difference we can make. So yeah. I'm excited about doing that. I know it's a big challenge, and I know I'm trying to do that alongside lots of other things. Yeah, but, yeah. You know, if you don't try something, it's never gonna happen. So. Absolutely. There she goes. Final part of the day, you're a legend. Thank you so much for having me. So much. It's great to see your game is in such good shape as well. Yeah, it was overdue to get out on the course with you. I really enjoyed it. Please let's you. not make it so long the next time. Yeah. It, next time we play, do you think we could just a little bit warmer? Let's hope it's summertime. Summer, <laughs> summer we'll be back.